Hey, it's Kay, and this is Skittles, Cinematographer. Today we're gonna talk about Enemy at the Gates, a movie that came out in 2001, meaning that according to my viewership statistics, many of you were not born yet when it was released. Which is fine. The reason I'm talking about this movie now, rather than something recent and popular that will get me more of those sweet clicks that I need to survive, is because, and you may have heard about this, Russia recently invaded Ukraine. But that's not what this video is about. This video is about, well, let's start by taking a look at this clip. I think we can't forget that Russen europäisch aussehen, dass es keine Europäer sind, jetzt im kulturellen Sinne, einen anderen Bezug zu Gewalt haben, einen anderen Bezug zu Tod haben, sondern das Leben kann halt einfach auch mit dem, mit dem Tod recht früh enden. Ich meine, Russland hat zum Beispiel auch eine relativ niedrige Lebenserwartung, ich glaube 70 für Männer. Das ist halt einfach, dann geht man einfach anders damit um, dass halt dass da Menschen sterben. Ne? Mhm. That is German EU official and NATO advisor Florence Gobb explaining that Russians might look European, wink, but they're not really. And unlike us Europeans, they don't value life. Death is no big deal to them. This is insanely racist and is especially the kind of thing you do not want to be hearing from Germans. This sentiment is often expressed about Asian peoples that the West finds themselves in opposition to, such as the Vietnamese, as can be seen here. Well, the Oriental doesn't put the same high price on life as does the Westerner. Life is plentiful, life is cheap in the Orient. And uh, as the... Uh, philosophy uh, of, uh, of the Orient uh, uh, expresses it. Uh, uh, life is, uh, is not important. That was General William Westmoreland explaining that the atrocities the U.S. was committing in Vietnam weren't actually such a big deal because these dang Vietnamese, they just don't value human life. They don't care if they live or die. They're not proper, civilized people like us, the people bombing them. It's the exact same rhetoric. The idea of Russians as Eastern, or perhaps people like Gob would prefer Asiatic, rather than Western and European might seem unusual to some American viewers. But Europeans should be very familiar with the way that the inclusion of Slavs in whiteness has always been very conditional. Before the Syrian refugee crisis really turned the racist anti-immigrant rhetoric towards Muslims, one of the main targets of that rhetoric in the UK was actually Polish people. For now, the West likes Ukraine. They get to be white, Western, like us. Even though Gob cites Russia's low life expectancy, I wonder how that happened, as proof that they don't value human life. And Ukraine's life expectancy is actually slightly lower than Russia's. But Western powers favor them geopolitically at the moment, so people who have never had a kind word to say about Syrian refugees, for example, are suddenly speaking very differently about Ukrainian refugees because they're, you know, like us. For now. Russians, however, are not like us. Because they are a geopolitical opponent of the West. So, they get the same treatment as the people of Vietnam and other Asian countries that Western powers wish to dehumanize in the eyes of their population. Japan got a similar treatment in World War II. A large part of the justification for dropping an atomic bomb on Japan twice was based around this idea of the kamikaze fighter who didn't care if they died and that no amount of death would ever deter these inhuman Japanese hordes. Only a show of overwhelming force could do that. Again, just obscenely racist and still something a lot of people believe. This kind of rhetoric is not a critique of states or their actions, but an attack on an ethnic group. 
It is effectively race science. The idea of racializing geopolitical conflicts is what led to the US putting Japanese civilians in concentration camps during the war, by the way. I would have thought this didn't need saying, but every Russian is not responsible for the actions of their state. Any more than you are for yours, or Ukrainians are for theirs. But between sanctions on Russia and anti-Russian attacks on Russian immigrants, we seem very eager to punish regular Russians for something they did not do. This is called collective punishment, and it's a war crime. But it's okay when we do it to the bad people, as we've established. But including Russians and others in Eastern Europe in that kind of othering, orientalist rhetoric is not new. We've been doing it for a long, long time. Which brings us to the USSR, the Cold War, and how Cold War narratives have polluted our understanding of 20th century history. In this case, the Eastern Front of the Second World War. Enemy at the Gates is a Hollywood film, but with a French director, which was meant to lend a European perspective to a war that had generally been represented in a very American-centric way. The film is based on the life of a Soviet sniper named Vasily Zaitsev at the Battle of Stalingrad. This film, especially the opening sequence, paints a very specific picture of the battle and the Red Army overall. Vasily and throngs of nervous soldiers are herded onto a packed train, framed in a way that seems like it's meant to evoke images of another pretty infamous use of trains around World War II. The doors are sinisterly locked before they depart. Just a quick aside, if you've ever been on a train, those doors were definitely locked as well. But this is highlighted in service of telling us these guys aren't going entirely willingly. Frightened, disorganized soldiers are herded like cattle by shouting officers, pushed towards the front. They give every second person a rifle and the others a clip of ammunition, demonstrating that they are woefully undersupplied and don't seem to value the lives of their soldiers very much. They are then thrust into a suicidal charge on a German encampment that begins mowing them down, which prompts large numbers of these soldiers to, understandably, retreat. The retreating soldiers are then also mowed down by a wave of machine gun fire from their own side. So let's talk about this series of events. These scenes enormously contributed to the popular understanding of how the Battle of Stalingrad played out. Odds are good that you've got an uncle and or a father who, if prompted, will tell you all about how the Soviets used human wave tactics against the Germans with no concern for their losses, and that Soviet soldiers were more afraid of their commanding officers shooting them in the back than the Germans shooting them in the front. This sequence of events is worth exploring because none of this happened, and certainly not to Vasily Zaitsev. So these lovely fellows, gunning down masses of their own men, are based on a real thing. These were called barrier troops, or blocking units. Their job was to prevent unauthorized retreat, which was becoming a serious problem for the Soviets on the Eastern Front. The idea that they primarily did this by massacring fleeing troops is most likely derived from Stalin's infamous Order 227, in which he declared Soviet military policy would become not a step back. He cites significant territorial losses due to irresponsible and frequent retreats made with the view that due to the USSR's vast size, units that were caught off guard by Germany's sudden offensive could afford to pull back repeatedly until more favorable conditions presented themselves. These retreats ended up surrendering massive amounts of supplies and munitions into German hands, as well as exposing Soviet citizens to the Nazis. So the view from the top was that this had to stop. That Stalingrad would be where they made their stand. Now this led to one of the bloodiest battles in the history of warfare, and it is also generally considered the battle that turned the tide of the war and led to the ultimate defeat of the Nazis. 
So I'm not going to even attempt to weigh up in this video whether this was the right decision or not, but for our purposes, there's an important part of Order 227 that needs to be considered. Stalin explicitly gave barrier troops the authority to execute, quote, cowards and panic mongers. One thing that should be noted is this order seems to be particularly focused on commanding officers, not the average soldier. This is part of why, despite having the authority to shoot people for desertion, the vast majority of soldiers who interacted with barrier troops were simply sent back to the front. There were executions, as there were amongst pretty much every country that fought in World War II. Given the scale of the war on the Eastern Front, there was even quite a lot of executions. Not saying it's great, but there is simply no record of anything even close to this outrageous display here. Or the often repeated suggestions that Soviets killed as many of their own as the Germans did. It just didn't happen. And barrier troops were primarily dealing with those attempting to flee the city altogether, not pulling back from failed attacks. Next is the idea that rifles were only being given to every alternate soldier, and the poor bastards who just got a clip of ammo would have to wait until the guy in front of them was shot and pick up his rifle. This never happened. In my research for this video, I may have identified the origin of this idea. The closest thing to evidence for this that I could find was an interview with Major General Alexander Ilyich Rodimstev, in which he says that while awaiting deployment to the front, his men were only half-armed. He requested weapons before moving into the city to fight, and they were promptly given to him. His men were supplied with ammunition on the boat ride over. They were fully armed by the time they reached the front, which is nothing like what is depicted in the film. At no point are soldiers charging a German position without weapons. There were instances of not having enough weapons to go around in other earlier battles in the war. Germany's attack was sudden, and some units found themselves encircled and quickly undersupplied. But this was an outlier, and it never happened in Stalingrad. And certainly not to Vasily. And we know that because Vasily's notes, which serve to some degree as source material for this film, make no mention of either this or the mass murder by barrier troops. The real Vasily never even interacted with barrier troops at all. I'm sure there were plenty of scared and undertrained soldiers fighting in Stalingrad, but it's worth mentioning that Vasily's notes, although it is just one man's perspective, describe the soldiers he was sent into battle with as nervous but patriotic, and determined to defend their home, which is not surprising considering that people had become aware of the Nazis' mass murder of millions of Soviet POWs at this point. Their invasion was not just to take land and resources, it was part of their project of genocide, which considered Slavs subhuman. I can't help but think of Florence Gobb's comments when considering that fact. So you might have noticed a trend at this point. Many of the events depicted in this film are not entirely fabricated. They might be based on something that is technically true, such as the fact that barrier troops had the authority to shoot deserters and some deserters were shot, and take those particular events and make them general. It then becomes barrier troops were regularly mowing down entire squads just for pulling back, which would be an insane thing to do if you were trying to, you know, win a war. It's just not what happened. But it has that nugget of truth to give it credibility, and if you're accepting the premise already that these people just don't value human life, well... Same goes for sending in soldiers with only half of them armed. Individual stories of being undersupplied early in the war, which was in no way the norm, likewise are made general. It becomes the case that the Red Army was completely undersupplied to the point that it seemingly became official policy to only half-arm their soldiers. Another fiction with that little bit of truth behind it. That is the key to good propaganda, that sliver of legitimacy. But simply taking some liberties about how things happened does not make something propagandistic on its own. 
Enemy at the Gates is what you could call a composite story. Different elements and events from a vast and complicated war are condensed into singular events to give an overview of what the war was like. A great example of a composite is Bill O'Neill in Judas and the Black Messiah, which I have a video about if you want to hear more about it. Bill was an FBI informant in the Black Panther Party. In the movie, he is their driver, he actively encourages conflict within the party, and he even shows up with a bomb and tries to get Fred Hampton and others to do a bombing so they can be arrested for it. Those events are intertwined with many other things that we know he definitely did do, but there isn't really any evidence that he did the particular things I just listed. However, those are all tactics that are regularly employed by FBI informants. So, Bill becomes a composite of these tactics, and the movie ends up serving not just as a historical drama, but an educational guide to the tactics of FBI informants. Meanwhile, Enemy at the Gates creates a composite of Stalingrad that includes the mass slaughter of soldiers, that never happened, and weapon shortages that aren't representative of the kinds of supply issues the Soviets were facing to create a composite that makes the USSR look as negative and inhumane as possible. That was a choice. And it was done in a way that's in keeping with efforts to sort of both sides, the Nazis and the Soviets, in order to reconcile the fact that the Soviets played the most pivotal role in defeating Germany and stopping the Holocaust, with the fact that they proceeded to spend decades as our big bad Cold War enemy. Even if they sacrificed millions to beat the Nazis, they still have to be bad enough that we don't gotta hand it to them. The composite opening scene of the battle seems to have done the most to misinform the public perception of Stalingrad and the Eastern Front more broadly, though Enemy at the Gates invented none of these ideas. There has been plenty of shoddy... history written about Stalingrad based on very little data that has reproduced this inaccurate picture of events. But let's move on to some things that are far more specific to this film. Vasily spends a large part of the movie working with another Red Army sniper, Kulikov. Kulikov in the film is a grizzled anti-communist whose dialogue is mostly rants about how communism is shit and the USSR is shit, which is understandable considering in the movie he was tortured by the NKVD, the Soviet secret police. Unlike some people who we will get to shortly, Kulikov does seem to have been a real man. He is mentioned frequently by Vasily in his notes, although there is no mention of any of his epic facts and logic communism-owning tirades. That was a fun Hollywood inclusion, so we wouldn't feel too sympathetic for the Soviets. Something that was entirely fabricated, however, was a love triangle between our protagonist Vasily, a translator turned Red Army soldier named Tanya Chernova, and a political officer named Danilov. The love triangle did not exist. In fact, Tanya Chernova did not exist. However, Danilov was a real person. And that's a bit of a problem. There's this absolutely bonkers scene where Khrushchev is chastising the commander who led the unsuccessful charge on the German position from the opening sequence. Khrushchev threatens to tell Stalin he did a bad job, so he immediately shoots himself in the head. He implies that the main reason it's important for them to hold Stalingrad is because it's named after Big Joe himself. He then scolds the political officers for failing to motivate the troops adequately. What follows is some of the most heavy-handed propaganda I've ever seen. Khrushchev asks them for ideas on how to solve this problem. Everyone sheepishly suggests things like, uh, uh, have we tried killing them for disobedience? H have we tried deporting their families? <laughs> but, but then Danilov speaks up. He says, Give them hope. And suggests a campaign of positive propaganda centered around the heroics of the sniper Vasily. And Khrushchev looks at him like, Oh, you crazy son of a bitch. A plan that doesn't involve killing our own men? Sounds pretty far-fetched, but okay, son, give it a shot. 
This scene is cartoonish. Can you imagine ever seeing a scene like this about the Americans in the war? But Danilov sets himself apart, as apparently the only communist in history who can think of non-murder-oriented solutions. And so the story of Vasily is born. But this won't do. Danilov seems to be a true believer. He is a communist who thinks communism is good. Maybe the only one in the movie. In contrast to the cynical tyrants who seem to make up most of the Soviet leadership. That is not a position this movie seems prepared to accept. While Kulikov was reimagined as an anti-communist, something similar was done to Vasily himself. Vasily in the movie is an illiterate peasant who expresses no real interest in politics one way or another. The real Vasily was perfectly literate. He had elementary schooling and was studying accountancy before the war. In fact, the USSR was quite renowned at the time for its enormous literacy programs, which rapidly brought it to similar levels as those found in the West compared to Tsarist Russia before it, which largely reserved education for the elites. But that is one of those things that reflects positively on the USSR, so it's being downplayed here. By making Vasily illiterate, the dynamic between him and political officer Danilov becomes one of exploitation. Danilov is putting words in his mouth and using him as a propaganda piece for the war. The image of the Soviet super sniper. This is something being done to Vasily, not something he's an active participant in. But the real Vasily was not only literate, he was an enthusiastic participant in the propaganda project around his success as a sniper. He needed no manipulation or persuading from Danilov, because Vasily in his notes makes two things extremely clear. He is a massive communist, and he very much likes the USSR. He was a politically aware person with his own agency, and he chose to play the part that he did in the propaganda battle that raged around Stalingrad. That's the tricky thing about a movie with Red Army protagonists. A lot of them are going to be communists. The choice to not accurately represent this fact could be very easily attributed to the feeling that Western audiences wouldn't want to watch a movie with a communist protagonist. Which might be true, but coupled with the repeated bending of historical fact to represent the Soviets in as bad a light as possible, it's hard not to feel like it was a bit more ideological than that. I'm not asking for some kind of Soviet propaganda film. I'm asking for a bit of respect for history and the real people whose stories are being used to make this movie. Max Hardberger, great name, who wrote the foreword to the English translation of Vasily's notes, said about Enemy at the Gates, We believe Zaitsev would have been appalled by this fiction and disgusted that his name has been associated with it. I doubt the real Danilov would have liked it much better. They do Danilov dirty towards the end of this movie. The only guy in the film who seems to actually like communism has a crisis of belief after failing to win the heart of Tanya. This leads him to give an absolutely incredible speech, in which he announces that communism is impossible because some people will have more luck at love than others. Therefore, equality cannot exist. Man will always be man. There is no new man. We tried so hard to create a society that was equal, where there'd be nothing to envy your neighbor. But there's always something to envy. There will always be rich and poor. Rich in love. Poor in love. Basically, communism doesn't work because I'm a huge incel. After declaring that he gets absolutely zero maidens and has therefore abandoned all of his political beliefs, he kills himself. So, obviously, this never happened. But also, what a horrible thing to do to the legacy of a real person. They wrote this guy to be the most pathetic loser imaginable. And for what? Some completely incoherent diatribe about how communism can't work because the girl he liked preferred somebody else? This was a real guy 
James Cameron pretty infamously had to make a public apology after his depiction of First Officer William McMaster Murdoch in Titanic. Murdoch was depicted taking bribes to let people onto lifeboats before accidentally murdering some passengers and taking his own life. The film treats this guy like a corrupt coward, but he was a real person and none of that stuff actually happened and his family took exception to that. Taking real people and dragging them through the mud like that is considered really inappropriate when writing historical films like this. Can you imagine, say, Steven Spielberg doing something like this with a real veteran in Saving Private Ryan? People would have freaked out. But we don't have to show that same respect because, you know, Soviet's bad. Actually, Saving Private Ryan is a good point of comparison here. Enemy at the Gates was trumpeted as a sort of answer to Saving Private Ryan's popular, America-centric depiction of the war from three years earlier. But how does it compare to Spielberg's movie? Both movies do open with nervous soldiers traveling to the front where they're thrust into a suicidal charge against a well-defended German position. But the feeling of the American troops is much more determined, duty-bound. They sound more like the way Vasily describes the men he traveled to the front with in his notes. They don't need commanders forcing them forward. While the Soviet troops are scared, unprepared, and being forced into battle with a gun at their backs, these are our big brave boys, and their commitment to freedom is all the motivation they need to leap into the fight. This opening sequence is definitely flattering to the Americans, but it's also really well done. Spielberg studied footage from real war photographers who were there when the Americans stormed the beach and consulted with veterans. It was important to him that this movie was authentic, in an environment where World War II vets were pretty unhappy about how Hollywood often depicted the war. And that makes the actual plot of Saving Private Ryan even more baffling. It is completely ridiculous. After the beach scene, we're taken to the office of General George C. Marshall, who has learned that one mother has just received news that three of her four sons have died in battle. The general decides that, in one of the most important moments of the war on the Western Front, the U.S. Army would dedicate resources to finding the surviving Ryan brother and bringing him home. For no other reason than to make this one grieving mother have to suffer a little less. That might seem completely insane to even think about in a war in which so many millions of mothers would be grieving. But it's also, if this wasn't obvious, complete fiction. The plot and all the main characters in Saving Private Ryan are fictional. Which allowed Spielberg a lot of creative freedom without having to worry about, you know, massively slandering a real person. This guy objects to the plan, being the only person in the room with a brain, apparently, saying this is a gross misuse of resources. But then the general reads a letter from Abraham Lincoln, addressed to a grieving mother during the Civil War. And that's it. The discussion is over. The argument is won. Lincoln was invoked. So that's that. Owned, idiot. Lincoln brings to mind the best of America, the fight to end slavery. There's a lot more to it than that, but that is the popular conception of the Civil War. That war, like this one, is a good war, and America is good for fighting it. This idea of being the good guys and fighting the good war has had disastrous effects. I have to quote at length from Howard Zinn's absolutely scathing review of Saving Private Ryan because he says it perfectly. In Saving Private Ryan, there is never any doubt that the cause is just. This is the good war. Yes, getting rid of fascism was a good cause, but does that unquestionably make it a good war? The war corrupted us, did it not? The hate it engendered was not confined to Nazis. We put Japanese families in concentration camps. We killed huge numbers of innocent people. The word atrocity fits in our bombings of Dresden, Hamburg, Tokyo, and finally Hiroshima and Nagasaki. 
And when the war ended, we and our allies began preparing for another war, this time with nuclear weapons which, if used, would make Hitler's Holocaust look puny. We can argue endlessly over whether there was an alternative in the short run, whether fascism could have been resisted without 50 million dead. But the long-term effect of World War II on our thinking was pernicious and deep. It made war so thoroughly discredited by the senseless slaughter of World War I noble once again. It enabled political leaders, whatever miserable adventure they would take us into, whatever mayhem they would wreak on other people, two million dead in Korea, at least that many in Southeast Asia, hundreds of thousands in Iraq, and on our own, to invoke World War II as a model. The presumed absolute goodness of World War II created an aura of rightness around war itself. Note the absence of a great movement of protest against the Korean War, which only an adventure as monstrously evil, as soaked in official lies as Vietnam, could dispel. Vietnam caused large numbers of Americans to question the enterprise of war itself. Now saving Private Ryan, aided by superb cinematographic technology, draws on our deep feeling for the GIs in order to rescue not just Private Ryan, but the good name of war. I will not be surprised if Spielberg gets an Academy Award. Did not Kissinger get a Nobel Prize? Here is Spielberg some months later with his Academy Award for Saving Private Ryan. While Saving Private Ryan fabricates characters and events in the service of making the US military appear deeply empathetic and humane, so much so that they would dedicate resources just to easing the pain of a single grieving mother. The ways Enemy at the Gates deviates from historical accuracy are almost always with the goal of making the Soviets look monstrous. Any and all American atrocities can be easily overlooked to show their part in the war as good and their soldiers as heroic. But that heroism can never be afforded to the Red Army, to the bad people in the bad country. This war was only a good war when the good guys fought it. These two movies seem like opposites, but in a way, they are exactly the same. They both tell us stories about this war from an American perspective, even if one is technically about the Soviets. No matter how dark America's history is, it has always afforded a certain benefit of the doubt. When America does something terrible, it is not fundamentally evil. It is failing to live up to its ideals. Often, it is met with choruses of this is not who we are and this is not normal. Liberal critics of America couch it in the assertion that America can and will strive towards its stated goals of equality and freedom even if it consistently fails to meet them. Can you imagine us giving that kind of leeway to the USSR? Their stated goals also included equality and freedom. They include an end to the oppression of class society, a class society that very directly contributed to both world wars. But when they fail to live up to those ideals, we don't pat them on the back and say, hey, you're better than this, you can do it. We condemn them as fundamentally evil. America is good at heart, even if it never, ever proves it. But America's enemies? They're bad deep down. And when they do something wrong, that only confirms it. To bring this back to Gob's racist diatribe from the beginning of the video, these people are other. They have inherent traits that make them abhorrent to us and incompatible with our idea of civilization. They can't fight the good war because they are not good. With Saving Private Ryan, Spielberg succeeded in his goal of making a World War II movie that American veterans would actually appreciate. U.S. vets widely praised him for his accurate depictions of what the war looked like. Do you think Soviet veterans felt as positively about Enemy at the Gates? Mm -hmm.